Right. We're going to call mm -hmm. the community meeting to order. It, it is, let's see, 617. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Yeah. I'm going to, I have a little to say today, very, very little, I promise. I just wanted to first say buenas noches. Today is uh, is one of my favorite holidays in Guatemala. It's Fiambre, Old Saints Day. And usually families get together and they share food and every, it's like a big potluck. So it's like huge salad. And I'm excited actually to be here with you and be able to sort of be in community. So thank you for coming. It's such a cold night today uh, and for your willingness to participate. And I know some of you have been here all day already. So even thank you for staying longer. Uh, when I think about the families who lost loved ones in Maine last week, and even about the incident that occurred in one of our school buses right here in the backyard, I'm reminded that we're living in uncertain times. But it's especially during these times that it's important to come together. And what we can change is what we can do in our communities here together. Uh, we're so fortunate that no one on the bus was hurt. Uh, we're grateful for the professional actions of our bus driver, and we're waiting for the police investigation to play out. As soon as we have more information, we will share this with the community. In the meantime, we're also lucky to have amazing leaders in our schools, and they are sitting here with us today. Thank you, Jess, Stephen, Megan, uh, uh, who are providing, they are not just leaders, but they also are providing the care and support to all our students. Uh, though we may come from different backgrounds and have different points of view, mm -hmm. we all share the same goal, everybody here in this room to today, to provide safe and accepting environments for our children and to learn so that they can learn to grow. And um, sorry, I didn't have a lot of time to prep, but to be, you know, caring, thoughtful and successful adults, uh, whatever success means to all of you. We want the best opportunities for our kids. And we also want to make sure that the future of our school district is sustainable. And that's why we're here today. Um, I don't know how many of you have followed the strategic planning meetings and the common core, oh. the common core, the core beliefs that we've been working uh, on. So I wanted to share just one, uh, one of my favorite, all of them are my favorite, but this one, I feel like we did a good job with the uh, input that we have received over the past few months and the, uh, the committee met and also did a little bit more work on it. And that that is important today. So core belief is on transparent and responsible governance. Uh, and this is uh, what what how it reads. All decisions about our schools must be student centered. The board makes decisions using data and input from the community. Our processes are clear, predictable, inclusive, and transparent. Um, as you know, the core beliefs is what we all believe, what we all care and believe of as a community. So tonight, just by coming here and sharing this night with us, we have something in common. You came out in a cold night and are willing to share your ideas and your thoughts. So we'll get the meeting started with that. I'm looking, uh, I wanna make one adjustment to the agenda, but first I'm gonna ask my board members if they have any adjustments to the agenda. So the teachers met this afternoon. So I wanna, we would like to add an extra action on their executive session. After coming out of executive session, ratifying the contract. So I'm gonna ask for a motion to accept. This is something that we learned at our last learning with our, with our, ledger, with our lawyers. So I'm gonna ask for a motion to accept the change to the agenda. Thank you, Jonas, a second. Thank you, McKenna. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. So let's get started. So uh, thank you guests for being here. We already said hello. Any of you have public comments that you wanna make before we get started? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Anybody online, please raise your hand. I don't see any hands up. So, oh, Lisa. Oh, go ahead. go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. 
Yes. 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 At the end it, of the it, presentation, we at the end of the presentation, we're going to have two questions and yeah, and we're going to separate just for continue to make it easier. We're going to separate the people online and the people present. So it's easier uh, to get your input. OK. All right. Or is it possible? I'd like to know. Uh, you can sign in, but I can I can tell you uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven community members and some administrators. Do you want names? Or no, okay. So, it, with that, Jillian, thank you for having us at your school. You are up to share with us. Share it with the oh, oh, access. Yeah, sorry about that. No, you're gonna get to. Uh, to use the OT. Yes. Sorry about that. Oh, that's fine. Oh, how? Oh, maybe he's here. I think he might have to do it. Uh, that one. Yeah. Uh, click on the little here, right? This one. Event sharing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, good evening and welcome to Jody. I'm not quite sure why I want to. Sorry, Lisa, I'm going to have my, my back to you. Um, so, welcome to Jody. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all here in our lovely Cafe Gymatorium, where I will just point out today the five, like, six students used the parachute to, we we're trying to simulate earthquakes. I'm not sure how well we simulated earthquakes, but we did actually figure out a lot about energy and motion and all that. So there's a lot that happens in this space. So is it my imagination or is there an echo or something? Yeah. Yeah, trying to. All right, thank you. So um, part of these traveling board meetings is to give both the board and the visitors a view into what we're doing around social emotional learning and supports at each school. So I'm gonna go through those and talk about what we do here at Doty. So at Doty, the key thing is that social emotional care and learning starts before students even step foot into school. And so every morning there are, um, it's usually me, Maureen McDermott and Lydia Facey, and then assorted others out greeting the students every day. There are two really important reasons for this. The first reason is that students need to know that we're happy to see them. They need to be welcomed. They need to be brought in. They need the smile. They need to know that they're wanted here so that they have a sense of belonging. Another thing that it does for us is it um, gives us a quick read on students. So if a student comes in and they're just a little slower, or a little faster, or just a little different, they seem a little off. We know before they even get into the door, who are the kiddos that we may need to spe spend a little extra um, time with and just come back and check in on. Um, or for students who are dropped off, if the student is looking a little low, we can run out to the parking lot and just check and say, hey, you know, Susie seems a little low, everything okay, and then Usually it's something like she wanted a French braid, but we didn't have time to do it. And that happened. It's true. 
Another key component of our social emotional is the development of our community. We know that students and people thrive in relationships. There's a really, I think, a really interesting body of research that's starting to come out about the impact of loneliness and isolation on overall mental health and well-being. And so here at Todi, we strive to create a community within the school and across the school. Mm -hmm. And so we periodically have whimsical bulletin boards monthly. So our October one caught in the web of friends. And so each student made a spider and then contributed to it. And then my lovely colleagues put me in the, the middle. So I get to be either about to be eaten or get to be caught up in the web of friends. And that really is just, that's sort of like we put ourselves in there. Everything is, there is no individual. It is Dodi. Other things that we do here is in the image on the left, you can see some older students helping some younger students in the library. We do all school morning meetings. Uh, on the right, we have some of our pre-K students in the library. In our library, we really seek to have a diverse and inclusive collection. One of the things that we know that's really important for students for marginalized populations, especially, is to be able to see themselves and their families and their experiences reflected in the books that they're reading. Again, getting back to that loneliness and that need for relationships, when students feel seen and heard and validated, it brings up the baseline. Here we have some pictures of some fifth and sixth graders reading with our second graders. Just another way of bridging across the grades, creating that sense of community, removing feelings and barriers and thoughts of isolation. And this one I had to give its own slide, our sixth graders. I think it just exemplifies, Dodi, we've got our, our biggest kids and our littlest kids. And our sixth graders were helping our pre-K students on the climbing wall a few weeks ago. And that, again, it's that community and that interrelatedness. The next thing is about, about our social emotional programs here. It's about clarity and teaching. We need to be really clear. Uh, something I picked up a long time ago, a phrase I use a lot is, you cannot expect it if you did not teach it. And so we need to be clear in what are our expectations because when we're not clear, there's a wiggle room and that can create anxiety. And so then you're just setting kids up there. And then we need to teach students. We, we do not come into school and into this world learning how to interact, learning how to manage our feelings. So we set the clear expectations and then we don't just say, okay, well now go do it. We provide the teaching. And so here's an example of some work that our five sixers did about emotional vocabulary, thinking about what is the emotion and then how does it feel? What are some of the words that go along with it? So that then when these um, feelings and sensations come up within the students, they're able to then say, I'm, you know, I've got this feeling of emptiness right now. What, it, you know, what's it about? Oh, maybe I'm feeling sad and helping them develop the vocabulary to do that. Oops. Uh, so the other thing about this that's really key, and this is borrowed from Rick Wormley, who's done a ton of work on, on differentiation, is when we're working with students and teaching them about any skill, there are two ways you can look at it. A student gets into a hole, a student is struggling. You can put a ladder down and stand at the edge of the hole and say, okay, come on, climb the ladder, climb the ladder. You can do it, you can do it. But you don't know if the rungs are properly spaced 
for the student. You know, don't know if the student's ever encountered a ladder before. And so the student may be down there in the bottom of the hole and may just be feeling really nervous and you're not doing the student any favors. But when we put down the ladder and we say, I'm going to come down there with you and I'm going to get in that hole and I'm going to climb up this ladder with you and be behind you and support you, then that's what we do here at Doty. We get down in the hole and we climb up and we support the students, giving them the tools along the way. So what are these supports that we have? We have on the left, Nurse Lydia, who does far more than just Band-Aids and bonks, although today there were a lot of Band-Aids and bonks but also checking in with students, checking in, um, being a place where they can just come in and just take a second to get away from things. Uh, we have a student and a paraeducator up there. It's Halloween, she's dressed up as thing one or thing two, I can't remember which, mm -hmm. um, but they were working together. So again, just that bonding, we're here for you. We're down in that hole, we're climbing out with you. And then in the bottom right here is Maureen. It's a Halloween special for a kindergarten guidance counts class. But even in reading the story, she's talking about what is the character feeling? What might you do? All those sorts of things that happen along the way. Uh, this is, the credit goes to Nurse Lydia for this one. This is our Zen Den, which is a right out there, and it is a redesigned, reconceit, I don't can't think of the, it's a re-something space where students can come and just, if they just need a minute, and talking, one of the things that we're really working with kids about is becoming aware of their internal emotional states so that then they can say, I just need a minute and then they can come and experience some Zen and just chillax for a few minutes with an adult, take a time out, take a breath and then go back. Another thing that we are doing is one of our paraeducators, Beth Stern, took the Breathe for Change yoga uh, course over the summer and the Breathe for Change yoga class is really organized around um, helping kids learn self-regulation skills. So we are incorporating yoga movement breaks. So, and then also doing some, the lower left is some students doing some team building exercises. Then the final thing that we've done a lot of work on this year is listening to what our students are showing us. And that's the behaviors. How do we keep track of behaviors? How do we identify them? What I might call disruptive, you might not call disruptive. What I might call disrespectful, you might say, oh, that's just a student saving face. So at the beginning of the year, we spent a great deal of time uh, looking at how do we track behaviors or things that students are doing? And how do we reconceptualize it and sort of move away from this language of an office discipline referral to an incident report or a safety report? What are we seeing? What are we noticing? And then more importantly, what are we doing with that information? So I just put a couple of snippets on the incident reports. These are for things with, because we use the responsive classroom model, which talks a lot about this, the setting, the expectations and the reminders and what teachers can do within the classroom. These are filed for when a, something, a student is exhibiting a behavior and has not changed within, with two reminders. Then, so that could be something like a side conversation or a distracting noise. We actually had a lot of conversations about wandering and you'll see over on the safety reports, we have elopement or fleeing. And we were talking about, well, what are the reasons that students kind of get up and are not where they're supposed to be? And thinking about what's behind it. And the wandering is sometimes just, somebody's just a little overwhelmed. Uh, they come back when you, when you ask them to. And then on the right-hand side, we have another Google form, which is for safety reports. And 
those are the you know non-accidental physical contact with another person. So really deliberately framing it that way, it's not just about physical aggression. In the write-up, we might specify that it was an aggressive act, but it could be, do we have a student who uh, perhaps is, is doing some sensory seeking behavior by kind of bashing into other kids? That happens uh, a fair amount. So sort of taking the judgment language out of it, non-accidental physical contact with another student. So we're able to then, it feeds into a spreadsheet and we're able to then look at patterns and discover is, um, is Meg struggling um, at every board meeting at 7.30? And if we look at it, oh gosh, then we can sit and we can talk with Meg and say, Meg, it seems like every board meeting at about 7.30, you really start to struggle. What do you think, sorry? <laughs> no, I'm not sorry at all. Uh, <laughs> that's a lie. <laughs> the we can then say what's going on and and depending on how old Meg is she may you know we may prompt her through it oh it might just turn out she's hungry and we say you know what let's just have a snack right next to your computer and at 7 30 you can have your snack and we put that into place and she's doing better so that's the <laughs> beauty of this and just before, then we can take this and put it into IC. But this for us is, um, it may seem like adding an additional layer, but it makes it very quick and easy and accessible for us. So what I wanted to do is just end with, I call this a melange of adorableness because um, we are raising tiny people here and we're we are growing humans and the social emotional part is key if students are not ready and emotionally available their learning isn't going to happen and there are about a million different ways you can do it but it's about the care and the relationships and the community so enjoy the adorableness and thank you thank you Jillian So talking about students and adorable, I have two student members and it, they are not typically with us at our community forums and we're super excited to have them here with us. So I'm going to let them share a little bit. Very um, sensitive. Okay, Wena, you can go first. Oh, okay. Um, well, as everybody knows, yesterday was Halloween. Um, and so we did this thing at our school like we do every year, um, where students dress up for Halloween and we did a competition. And um our pep squad at U32 um had three jars of candy, like and everybody would try to guess how much candy was in each of the jars. And then um the winner who got like the closest number of each jar could um, pie like three staff members that were volunteering. Um, so that was a highlight, definitely. But... The results will be in soon. <laughs> we got to count the votes. <laughs> um, and so most of our sports besides cross country are all finished. So the field hockey girls and the Girls soccer made it semi to semifinals. And that's it. <laughs> um, the boys soccer and football made it to quarterfinals. So, and then I think the banquet is Monday, next Monday. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> and it was great. I think a lot of participation happened. There was a lot of excitement throughout the halls everyone really participated in team spirit people showed up and then tomorrow and then this weekend is um well boys girls and boys and girls cross country team are going to new england um boys have their eighth title this year and the girls got their second um ginger long is in the burlington free press and she's one of our runners at u32 so everybody should go vote for her yeah um yeah they have new england's this weekend it's gonna be great oh also um the school play is coming up uh which is peter and the star catcher and um i learned this morning that it is the like it's the movie before peter pan 
So it's just kind of giving me a little information. So that I believe starts tomorrow, the second, and then it goes to the fourth. I believe something like that. Yes, they have a full show this weekend. You should all go watch. <laughs> so sadly, there was an incident this past last week, and the bus got shot at. So. We obviously don't really know what happened, but we know it happened. The next day, everyone went to TA and had a really long discussion with their TA and their TA members. And we kind of just talked about what do we do now? And so I asked the board members to think, what would you do now? We are being sat in our classrooms discussing what to do now that our community just went through this. And the most unfortunate part is Maine had a shooting recently and the timeline is just so unfortunate because there's so much fear about going to school and being shot at. So sit with that for a second because as students, we face this fear every single day. We understand that it is a lot about, a lot of out, of everyone's control, but at the same time, it can be in our control. We as a community are failing. We need to be there for each other and understand that there is so much pain that people go through every day, but we can do something about that pain and we can be there for each other. So a quote that I recently came across was by S. Kelly Harrell. And I know Jess and Steven know it because I've told it to them before, but we don't heal in isolation, but in community. So going forward, when we were asked, what do we do now? I suggested that we start here. We start in our small community and hope that our, our nation can understand what to do next because we are not doing well. And it's up to now the kids who have to go to school to figure that out. So I beg you to be kind to each other, to figure out what our community needs to do better so this doesn't happen again. Thank you. Thank you, Lena and Willow. And as we can see, our future is bright with you. And we're gonna get there. Yep. Yep, Spencer, you can share the slides. And um, I'm going to thank Gillian in advance because she made some copies for us. So she's working on making some copies for us, which she did not know that she, we were going to need her to do. So she's being a wonderful hostess. So you have to start while she's making yeah, copies? that sounds okay. good. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> we'll do it's better. A little, yeah, it's, it's a little heavy. I get closer so I can lift that up. So we'll get started while they're making the copies. So this this forum is about sharing some information about how the budget process works. Sorry, and and about gathering some information early to inform the remaining of the the remaining parts of the process. Uh, we call it building the vision before uh, the budget because our goal is to help the board and the community ground the budget and financial decisions uh, and would actually want for our learners and how a school budget can support all of our students. Uh, best outcomes for kids, sustainability and more opportunities is what we are hoping for our kids. Thank you. So I'm gonna situate where we are in the budget process a little bit. The board and anyone who sort of comes to all of our meetings will see this several times. Um, in October, we had our annual budget training, um, which is when we uh, remind ourselves how Vermont education funding works. We talk a little bit about our current realities. And this year, got some really early information about um, just uh, budget assumptions. Um, and there is a little bit of information in, in these slides as well about that. Tonight is our community input session. Um, so this is really the, an opportunity, uh, one of several, to be able to give input at this early of a process. Um, the first budget draft will be presented to the board on November 15th. Um, and that includes 
input we receive here, input we receive from faculty and staff um, and students, and um, then the board will discuss that. They'll give administration some direction. On December 20th, we'll have another budget meeting. Um, that's an opportunity to share any changes, any new information. Uh, a lot of the information at this stage of the budget process is um, fluctuates. Um, so we will do that on the 20th. The goal is that our budget meeting on January 17th would be when the board would approve their final budget uh, and start the process of warning the budget for voting. Our annual meeting is March 4th and town meeting day we vote. And this is what we hope to do tonight. Um, we start, as Floor shared, um, with understanding our vision, our values, and our strategic plan, because that is what our budget needs to support. Um, you've, you've heard a little bit even today from our students, um, but this is the most important part of the budget process. What is it that we need to do? Um, then we're going to share what we know right now about our budget context and some realities. These are things that we need to be aware of as we plan that budget to support our vision. Um, and then it's an opportunity for an input session. And we'll talk a little bit about what that will look like. We will have an opportunity for those folks um, on the screen um, and the folks in the room. And I'm gonna start Okay, this is our mission. Um, I'm gonna read it even though it's up on the screen. Um, I see copies coming around. It won't be a, until a few slides in that you'll really need them. Um, there's some numbers on some slides that are small, so um, you, you don't need it yet. But Washington Central exists to nurture and inspire in all students the passion, creativity, and power to contribute to their local and global communities. The document uh, that is coming around. This is too small to read, and I'm not I'm not going to read it to you. But this is the uh, I think version 3.0 of our vision and core beliefs that are coming out of our strategic planning process. This document really grounds the work of the district. Um, the board, when this plan is um, complete, will adopt goals and action steps under each one of these, and this drives the work of the district. Um, so just in terms of what the five belief areas are, it's rigorous curriculum and instruction, well-being, we just talked about well-being, uh, humanity, justice, community, and belonging, community engagement and relationships, and transparent and responsible governance. So the budget that we eventually adopt has to support our work in these areas. We um, internally in the organization, we organize all of our work around th these three areas. We call them our three pillars, um, and that's academic achievement, it's safe and healthy schools, and it's humanity and justice. Um, and each year when we kick off our work, we situate what we're doing in each one of these. Um, so there will be a number of resources, both personnel and otherwise, supporting each one of these in the budget that you will eventually see. What um, some key pieces are our multi-layered system of supports, our implementation of Act 173, which is how we support all of our learners, our work around social emotional learning and school safety, and our humanity and justice pillar, which is both infused in all of the areas, but it also stands alone because we have we know we have work to do. And so again, those areas. Um, as you think about giving the board input in this process, know that what we're trying to achieve is those things, are those things. And now we're going to move into the part where we give you some information about uh, just current budget context and realities. And Suzanne, who's sitting in the audience, will kick us off. Hi. Several things are creating pressure on the amount required for local education spending in FY25, including the loss of $574,000 in ARP ESSER funding for personnel, anticipated reductions in titles grant funding, the elimination of the small schools grant, the reduction in the special education block grant resulting from Act 173 funding changes, as well as reductions to meal reimbursement rates. 
Costs are estimated to increase to support salaries, benefits, transportation, capital expenditures, and other areas of operations. Continued declines in enrollment will negatively impact the district per pupil spending, but the district does benefit from the changes in pupil weighting that takes effect for the FY25 budget. Thank you, Suzanne. So again, these are things that we need to be aware of. They're realities in our system and they are part of what we have to, um, have to factor in. So I'm gonna share a little bit of information about our enrollment. Um, I'm glad the copies have made themselves, uh, made their way around. Um, we're not gonna go into detail in this, but I'm gonna tell you what's in these slides. Um, and the first two, look at our, uh, our current enrollment, uh, the past few years and projected enrollment based on our own information, actual students in our system right now. And the projections are based on taking those students and advancing them and estimating a kindergarten number based on our pre-K. Um, and the theme here, this is not new information. This has been our reality for quite a few years. Um, our enrollment continues to decline uh, in each of our buildings individually. There's some variation in the um, how much it declines and then ourselves as a district. And this next slide is another version of that information. So the, the underneath the bar lines in that graph are illustrative of the fact that we've declined in enrollment um, over the past five years. This next slide, again, uh, in front of you, it's a lot of information. Those of you on the screen, this will all be linked uh, in the board resources page for you to refer to later. These are um, a, a different way of looking at enrollment. Um, the New England School Development Council, I think that is the, yep, that's the acronym. So NESDEC is a um, organization that does a number of things for most schools in our region. One of them is they look at demographics. So they look at actual enrollment. We report our enrollment to them and they take a few additional factors into consideration when they do enrollment projections. So they look at birth rates, they look at um, housing approval and sort of um, HUD numbers in our towns and um, they give us some additional projections. Uh, when you look at this chart compared to the one before you, it is going to look different for a couple of reasons. One, it does not include pre-K. The full report, which is linked on our website uh, and will be linked in this slide if you access it that way, has a lot more information. There's lots of different ways to look at this data. This is only one snapshot, um, but this chart does not include pre-K. They have other charts that do. The other thing it does not include for U32 is any students who access U32 through tuition, uh, our memorandum of, of understanding or school choice. So U32 serves more students than are listed on this chart, which is different than this. Whoops. This one has students inclusive of that. So, but again, these are here for purposes of tonight to really just help us understand that one of the contexts we have to deal with is declining enrollment over time. And I'm gonna pass it to Suzanne again for the next couple slides. So this graph illustrates that the majority of our resources are used to support direct instruction with a combined 59% allocation. Administration, operation of plant, and other support services account for 30% of the FY24 expenditure budget, the budget that we're currently operating under. And the remaining 11% of the budget is split between transportation, debt service, capital, food service, community connections, and co-curricular activities. The, <clears throat> excuse me, the revenue budget in FY24 is supported by local revenues like tuition, interest earnings, state reimbursements, special ed revenues, and other income. But the vast majority of the budget is funded by local education spending revenue. And again, these slides are here, particularly this first one, just to give you a sense of where the money goes. How do we spend our money? And the vast majority of the money in a school district is spent on people. Um, and that's 
that's just a reality. Um, so that's what those slides are for. Sorry again. Yeah, so the, you're looking at the slide of the budget parameters. The finance committee meets every year and establishes budget parameters that then shares with the board. And then the board discusses the parameters and, it, you know, and has a brainstorming session. And then we decide on those all together. So uh, I'm going to, I know that you can read them, but I'm still going to read them. So further development of the multi-layer system of supports, we have data to support that. So that's one of the parameters. Support accelerated growth for students from historically marginalized identities. Support our three pillars, academic achievement, as Megan was talking about at the beginning of the presentation, these are the three pillars for us. Um, academic achievements, safe and healthy schools, humanity and justice. Uh, support investment in school security. There was a new bill on uh, security for schools too. So that's part of, of that. And, and as you heard other concerns, uh, consider configuration changes that realizes program quality improvements. Uh, this is something that the ed quality has been talking about. So we wanted to make sure that this was here. And then under the spending threshold, Act 127 requires a tax rate review of spending per long-term weighted pupil to increase more, no more than by 10%. And that is just on the pupil. It's not like before, it's not this, the, like before we had a, the threshold and that was uh, the amount that we would be doubled the tax. This is per pupil. And if I missed something, Suzanne, please correct me. Uh, the net impact on the on under the October inflation rate. This is something that the board has talked about, but it's not a, a solid uh, parameter. We had talked about like you know we seeing what the the budget actually is. Is this uh, I would call it a soft parameter. We're not sure exactly what that number is gonna is gonna be, and we've heard things from three percent to three point four percent, but it is not a hard parameter. So I wanted to just make sure that we said that. And then frame the budget decisions around edu ed education quality standards, ed equitable distribution of resources and student need. Thank you. Um, and again, the purpose of this information is because it's, um, I think, helpful to have the picture of our situation as we give input. So the last piece of information we want to share, um, and the board saw this slide um, and anyone else who joined us in October, um, but just to give you an, a, an idea of the magnitude of our budget. So right now, so budget assumptions uh, are what would it cost to provide what we currently provide next year based on our assumed uh, increases, costs, labor costs, uh, you know, material supply costs, um, enrollment impacts. So this is what our uh, projected education spending would be next year on our what we currently offer. And it's an increase of about 12.89%. So every time you think of a 1% increase over the, the baseline, it's about $316,000. So, um, and again, reiterating what Floor said about a soft target, this is to illustrate, but um, if we were looking at a uh, getting down to a 3% increase um, that comes from ranges of inflation, that would be a 3 million, just over a $3 million um, reduction. So again, this is here just to give you a sense of the magnitude of, of what we're talking about. So before we move into the input session, I didn't know if there's, there will be time in the input session to dig into some of this, but are there burning questions that anyone either in the room or on the screen needs answered in order to, in order to give input? Yes. I have just two quick questions. Um, does the state mandate, um, you have to have a, a maximum amount of students per class Yes. yes. So, so the, the state, state has, has education, education quality standards. standards. Um, they're they're not, not. We did not review those in here, but um, they they do have uh, maximum class size guidelines. And, and what determines um, a student needing a paraeducator? Is that just is it totally arbitrary? Can it be more than one paraeducator for more than one student? So 
Yep, it's a great question. I would answer it in general terms this way. Students who need individual support or even just additional support um, specific to their disability, there are quite a few parameters around that. So they have a, an individual education plan that is developed by a team of people. So that's why it's not easy to answer exactly how that decision is made, but it is not random. It's based on the student's data and their disability and how they access their education. Um, so, and Kara, I don't know if you'd have anything to add to that. Okay. Yeah. Suzanne, do you want to? It's a mix. I would say it's primarily funded through fees that uh, users pay, uh, but the district does put some money from their general fund budget in, and then some of the town officials um, can do it. On that follow up question, can you have more than one paraeducator? Can you have two students with one paraeducator? If their needs can be met by one, yes. But it's driven by the needs of the student. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what we were gonna try to do just to be fair to everybody was gonna move break into two rooms so that we can have a conversation with the people that are present here and then one conversation with the people that are online. So we were gonna we were prepped to break. Kari, are you Okay, with this plan, yeah. So Kari and Jen or Kara, whoever of you want to go, and Spencer, do you mind taking the Zoom with you? And then we're gonna, if, just so that both groups know, it's these are the two questions that we were, you know, what did you learn from this overview? We're just gonna be doing a round. This is a process that we used at our last finance committee. You can do a pass, but we want to make sure that everybody in the room gets to. Uh, collaborate and this is the second question yep sorry and then logistically for the purposes of the folks um on the screen i'm going to create a breakout room because i think on the screen i'm going to assume that there may be some people who just want to listen to the conversation and some people who want to participate so i'm going to open up a breakout room folks on the screen can go into that room you will be able to hear conversation whether you stay here or whether you go into the other room. Um, but I'm going to open that up. So Jen or Kari, when you log in on your own, if I I will put you in there once you log in. And you would be in this computer, right, Spencer? Or then okay. So the first question is, what did you learn from this overview? And I'm going to go around and start maybe with people that are familiar with this process. I'm, I'm wondering, Jenny, do you want to get us started? And then I'll just, I'm just going to literally go person by person and you can say pass or you can go. And please just say your name and do the prompt, please. Thank you, Jenny. Yeah. Mrs. Knaylor or Michael? Beth, okay. Scott? Um, I didn't learn a lot. Um, I'd like to know what you're contemplating potentially cutting value to set in the very last presentation that I referred to from the school. The school cut that to staff. What what would be the impact to to the district? So what what are you contemplating? Thank you, Scott. Becca. Um, I mean, I'm still talking, but uh, I guess I'm sort of similar to what Jenny said. I'm struck by the um, it feels like there's parameters here that want to go above the ten percent. Increase right, and yet a level of services budget. 
Thank you. Um, gonna go back. Yeah, go. Yeah. Um, now I have a date that I like, I feel like I might get pushed off a cliff, um, as a staff member. So it's a little scary. Um, it's just a little scary having that date. It's good. It's good. I appreciate all the information, but it's going to loom in my head, like November 15th, what's going to come out that might change where I am next year. I like totally disrupt my life. Pass. Sure. Can you just make sure to say your name so not every board member is familiar with all the staff members too? Thank you. Uh, so hi, I'm Meredith Crandall um, and I actually grew up in this town um, and I'm now here raising two kids who both go here. Um, and so what I learned from this, echoing what Chani put in, was that the board definitely has a lot of really big decisions to make. Um, and the numbers are really important. And my hope is that you will, in your proposals, think about, think creatively as much as possible, um, both in how to deal with the numbers, but also how to keep the community and the relationships that Gillian's presentation was talking about this morning, um, how to keep those in mind, how to keep those strong, because they are very, very, very important. Um, my kids are part of the Worcester community, but they are also part of the larger community. They're involved in community connections. And because Dodie is so small, that community connections program is actually at Rumney. They also take part in, um, in the community connections program with vacation um, times. They get to meet kids at East Montpelier. They get to meet kids at lots of other schools in the district. But their strongest relationship is here right now in Worcester. Um, and that's really important. Um, and the Doty School also is involved in the larger community of Worcester. They're involved in the local weekly meal, weekly lunch, all of these things, and keeping those connections in mind and making sure that they aren't completely broken, I think is really, really important. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. I'm Lydia Fazy. I'm the nurse here at Doty, but I'm a taxpayer in East Montpelier. My kids went to school in this district. And I hope that we really keep track of what the kids need because there's a lot of need in this area, everywhere in the whole district. But I'm, I'm seeing that here in Worcester and I 
I hope that we really keep track of that. That's that should be everyone's focus. Thank you. No, that's okay. Um, I'm Lisa Hanna, uh, Worcester resident and parent of two kids here and former teacher here. Um, I mean, I think I learned that the magnitude looms large. Um, I think just the piece that I wanted to say right now is I'm feeling a little bit of maybe Alliance. I'm not sure if, I know Linnea, but I don't know her other student presenter's name. Willow. Willow. Hi, Willow. Um, but when you said, when you were expressing that feeling of like being asked in your role, like what do we do next? I feel a little bit like maybe I'm feeling that right now. Like I'm not sure as a community member without understanding more what's on the table, like what, what are maybe some of the things that are being considered? Because um, there's a lot of inferences I could make as a community member in Worcester about what might be on the table, but I, I, I don't know what ac actually is on the table with decisions of this magnitude, and it's hard to weigh in um, in my role without some of those possibilities. Um, so I'll just put that out there. So I just wanted to share one thing to be clear, there's nothing on the table yet, right? But we had in the budget, you know, we had our budget uh, communications last year. This is a brand new budget. We're, we're here is to gather input. What is important to you? What do you learn from this presentation? So there's nothing sort of planned or, you know, um, there, there's nothing planned. You're working with your administrators that in your just in your um, buildings. There's going to be some surveys. We have a finance committee that uh, we expanded the finance committee that includes a couple of principals to uh, extra board members so that we can make sure that we are as transparent as possible. But there's nothing yet. Yeah. So that's why you're not being presented with options yet. Yeah. And <laughs> like, I don't mean that in a nefarious way, either that yeah, I yeah. feel like it's not transparent so much as like a blank slate is really hard. And I mean, I don't want my school to close. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I don't know if that's on the table or not. Um, so I guess I'll just put that out there. And it certainly does not mean that I assume things are being kept from us so much as like, it is, it, I'm sure you all feel it's hard <laughs> to operate. Like this is big, right? And so those are just my feelings. Thank you. Did you have we already were. Okay. All right. So I think the two questions kind of blended themselves. Is there anybody else in the back that would like to share what they learned? from this overview? Sorry, but and then the next question was, you, some of you have already shared some of that, but is developing the budget requires the school board to make choices. Given what you heard tonight, what do you think the board should consider as they develop this budget? So does that spark any new input? Thank you, Chani. Um, also, thank you so much for coming here and for offering this opportunity to share input. Um, I, have had the privilege of being part of the strategic planning steering committee. And there are a couple of things, a couple of things that have emerged as bright lights for me um, that I think should be resourced. And I will also say I was on the school board for like nine years and these things were not really on my radar when I was on the board. So I say this with a lot of humility. Um, these weren't things that I was paying attention to, but years later, they seem really important. And I think um, pointing toward these things would really help us point toward wellness for our students in the future. And the first one is that we're not really set up in a way that supports um, youth to partner with adults in their education. Um, we don't do business in a way that um, makes like sharing power and decision-making with youth a normal part of how we do our work. And that has really shown up in the strategic planning process. Like we, it's, we don't have like natural things in place that allow for working together with youth on the things that impact them the most, like our strategic plan. <laughs> so um, I, and I think that needs to be resourced and there are really great resources and the change process, I think, would be, it would take time and be significant, but I think it would be incredibly meaningful. So I really hope that resourcing that could be part of the plan. The other thing that um, has been a bright light for me is that we are not set up in a way that makes it easy for information to flow from families and students who are dealing with the biggest struggles. 
and challenges. So we're set up in a way where we hear from, in general, folks who are um, experiencing more wellness and we don't hear, we don't have like an information flow that naturally allows us to understand more of the really important things that folks have to say, um, folks who are dealing with the biggest struggles. And I like that can be resource and it, it has to do with, again, like where we're putting, like what, what positions we have. And I, I wish I knew more about this, but I think there are probably models out there of schools that have really invested in engagement, like real engagement and partnership with families who are struggling the most. And I, I think it would be really smart for us to point towards some investments in that direction. Um, I always come back to this like connectedness, community connectedness is a protective factor against so many things. Um, youth violence, sexual harm. And um, I'll say that I really believe that having the community elementary schools is um, just an invaluable um, structure to support that kind of community connectedness. And I hope we'll look for savings in other places and not by eliminating one of the community schools. I've thought, I've been thinking about this for like, forever because this was an issue when I was on the board and I continue to feel like there's no substitute for the community schools. I hope that there can be other alternatives that are considered. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, go ahead. Um, I would just echo, well, a lot of what Chani just said, but um, particularly her second point around just um, really, really wishing and hoping and dreaming that we can move to a place where we think creatively and differently about community engagement. I mean, I think that I think that is a very true desire of the board and the community. And I think it is also very true. And I think, Johnny, you said it really eloquently that we often are not hearing from our community. We don't provide avenues that are available for our community who are who are most uh, often struggling in ways. Um, and I think that that like it was strategic planning, I, I know that it was put out by the district that that is what, you know, we wanted to, we were trying many ways to see community engagement. And I also think there are many ways that we've tried before. And I wonder if we could seek out other um, models that, that access different people in different ways. Thank you. I'll just make one quick comment. Um, I grew up in New Jersey. And my graduating class was a thousand people, um, and I did not excel. I came into my own when I went to college, and I and I've I've, I've been substitute teaching for the last six or eight months, and I really wish that I would have grown up in an environment like this. Um, I think I would have done much better, and I have big big changes or potential decisions to make. But it is really unique, and it's it's a wonderful small network that um, if you can make it work. So just a, an observation from big to it's, and your teachers are just amazing. Oh yes, my name is Honey Bean Barrett and I teach here at Odie. Um, I would just ask the board, I know you already do this, but I'm gonna say it. I know that you have to focus on the data but behind each data point is a person or child and that child or that staff member, they come from a whole family, like, and they're part of a bigger community. Like we're way more than numbers, way, way more than numbers. Um, so just keep that in your heart. Thank you. Anybody else? Are there any questions that we're not asking that you would like to share since we have a little bit more time, please? Mr. Duane. Yeah, thanks. Oh, Michael Duane, uh, East Montpelier. I'm just trying to uh, get my head around the schedule of tonight being November 1st and the first budget draft proposed for November 15th, which is only two weeks away, and there can be nothing on the table. That kind of doesn't make sense, but I understand what you're trying to grapple with. But 
35, 30, $31 million in, in the next two weeks and nothing's on the table. Um, can you give more generalities about how you're going to develop the first budget draft in two weeks involving $31 million and there being a clean slate and nothing on the table? Just to try to help me understand that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think what I would add, and I don't have a slide for it in this presentation, but um, one of the things we talk with the board about in their budget training is that we have three lenses that we use. So what I would say in answer to that question is we have a process for how we digest all the information that we get from you. And the we in this sense is the administration, because that's who brings the budget back to the board. Um, to digest the information from you all, to digest the information we get from our staff. Um, we have a group of budget ambassadors that include students. Um, you know, I work with a couple of students on the student council. So digesting all that input, we have three things we look at. We look at um, delivering quality education, um, and we look at that through best practice and, and Vermont's education quality standards, because that's our, that those are the regulations we follow. We look at how we distribute resources across the system, and we look at student need. And are we meeting the need and also taking into consideration the different needs in each of our buildings? So I can tell you that administration uses those lenses to say, what are the parameters? What do we have to invest in? What are we trying to achieve? The, I'm pointing at a slide and it's not up, but that was an earlier slide. Um, and then use that information to bring it back. So that's not answering your question of what's on the table, but it is telling you how we approach the conversation. Yes, um, so just trying to understand better and follow up to that, Megan, um, on the fiscal year 25 budget baseline, when it gives the numbers and the 12% difference, which is level level service, I don't know if I have the right words, right, but like not changing anything. Um, and then when it says on the bottom need to reduce by a little over 3 million to achieve 3%, is, is that the goal? So that's an illustration of one of the board's earlier parameters was to try to bring in a budget at inflation. Floor started off the conversation by saying that's a soft parameter on the part of the board, but they do need to give administration some kind of direction. And so that amount of money at the bottom is uh, October inflation rate, which has not actually, it would have settled yesterday, mm -hmm. um, hovers around 3%. So we just did a calculation to be able to illustrate the magnitude of the distance between the current state and that parameter. So now our job is to say, what do we need to resource to be able to deliver all of those things to students and all of the things that you shared? Um, we know that the board would like us to be judicious in doing that. Um, and we bring a proposal in, in a couple of weeks. Uh, I can't tell you what that percentage will be at that time. We just need some guidelines as administration. I have two follow-up questions to this yeah. gentleman's very wise thinking. Um, the first is, can you let me know, because I don't know, who is on the budget committee? Is it just board members, or does it include administration? Does it include community members and or staff? So the ambassadors are separate, and those, I will let her, and then I'll do the. I think you might have been referring to the finance committee. Sure. Yeah. So the finance committee is a subcommittee of the board. Okay. So the board show so that is a standing committee that the board has always have has always had. The purpose of committees in a board structure is not to make decisions by themselves. It's to do the deep dive work that is really hard to do as a group of 15. That's why we have a policy committee, we have an education quality committee and we have a finance committee. This board also a, two or three meetings ago decided that the study of configuration also needs to be done by a group that deep dives into it and has chosen to, de to delegate that deep dive to the finance committee. Um, they also recognized that at the time, the finance committee didn't have membership from every town. So they added two members, again, board subcommittee and invited two additional principals to be a part of it for the deep dive. 
decision making, information sharing all comes before the full board. And the board also approved an input process that goes from January until June. And that's where the voices of all of the others will come in. So that's the finance committee. The right. budget ambassadors yeah. that Floor is talking about is a newer structure that frankly, a, a couple of our principals suggested to say, let's bring folks from the schools into the process sooner and more often so that again, they can they can do the deep dive. Um, and we have volunteers from, I would say four out of our six buildings at this point. I'm hoping to have all of those by Friday. Hello, just one last question about that. I don't know if you can share this, that group that's meeting with the ambassadors and the finance committee, how often are they meeting between tonight where there's blank slate, nothing on the table and November 15th, because this creative work and this intense job they have, I'm just curious to know, like, do they have a couple of days they're planning to meet or is this like a next Wednesday, we hope to get the budget ready. But yeah, that's a, you know, that, that is a, that is a good question. And I just want to make one thing clear. The budget ambassadors are completely separate from the finances committee, right? The budget ambassadors, the idea is that we need, like you, you guys have all been saying, you know, we need more people communicating about the budget, what the budget needs are, what the conversations are, so that we have a more transparent way of making sure that everybody in the district is informed and also feels like they have a stake on what is important. There are some very hard decisions to make there's not a lot of time right between now and january or february so every year we start a little earlier right we start in september this year instead of in instead of in october so the committee meets on the finance committee meets the first tuesday of every month and we do the regular finance stuff that needs to happen right whether it is facilities whether it is a, a regular board orders whatever is the business of that and we leave a little time for a budget discussion if, if needed, but the the other committee of the board is meeting right before the meeting. Finding times to meet as a committee is really hard, right? So the third Wednesday that committee meets, brainstorms. We had a meeting on the 19th. The next meeting of that committee would be on November 15th, right? So it is not a lot of time, but at the same time, you have to remember that the board itself and that committee itself is, you know, with an equity lens on mine, is trying to do its best to support those parameters that we were saying, the three pillars that we keep talking about and hearing from you guys and the principals, what are the student needs? What do we need? And how can we be creative with the amount of resources that we have? So yes, it is some magic that we need to create, but I think we do have a lot of opportunities together and you guys are making those brainstorm, you know, better on how to communicate what is important to you. And, and hopefully by March, we, you know, we will have a past budget. <laughs> Mrs. Knaylor. Sorry. Like an Ellen Knaylor, East Montpelier. So the uh, finance committee meetings as the policy, the educational quality, those are all open meetings. Yes. Anyone can go. Yes. Anyone can go. And for what, what I have noticed, the finance committee <clears throat> will meet before a board meeting, but then they meet at eight o'clock in the morning on sometimes. Yep. And, and the uh, strategic planning committee meetings, are those open? And how about the um, budget ambassador meetings? Are those open? Can anybody go to those? Can they either zoom in? Can they show up or where the appointed place is? Or are those not available to anybody? Yeah, so strategic planning meetings are not, that's not a committee of the board. That's a group that was delegated by recruiting from across the district. So um, while they're open in the sense that we would welcome any audience members. It's often hard to get the entire committee itself all together at one time. Um, so they're open, but they're not meetings of the board. So they're not warned or things like that. Um, the
Hmm. I think that actually was a part of the um, share information sharing back last spring. The budget ambassadors, quite frankly, is a tool that administrators have created so that we hear from staff better. Um, and those meeting, the goal is to make that a manageable thing that our staff would volunteer for. So there would be a meeting in between um, a meeting in November, a meeting in December. Um, and I would say the community's opportunity to engage is through these processes. The budget ambassadors is a little bit different. It's a it's an opportunity for our staff in particular from each of our systems to weigh in. And I'm gonna do a logistical thing. Yes. The folks on the screen or the Ready. facilitators are just saying, let us know when to come back. So just let me know when I should close the okay. rooms. Okay, and we have, are, are oh, there, they are are they're, back. they're back. There we go. Okay. We'll let them come in. It, Shani, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I'm guessing you may not be able to answer this and I totally get that. Um, and I know that this would not impact the current year budget or maybe even the next year budget, but I'm curious if you can say anything about mm -hmm. configuration conversations related to potential merger with Montpelier and the kind of long-term savings that potentially could be realized through that. Yeah. So I think what we had what we had shared with the what we had shared with the board and had shared with the community was that it the it, both the superintendent and the board chair and the superintendent your superintendent and your board chair we met and we tried to figure out where everybody was at at a time and what we realized is that we are both both districts are involved in the same sort of process right now they're trying to. They, they're going through not necessarily a strategic plan meeting, but they are having community meetings to see what is important, what their core beliefs are without it really is not a strategic plan, but they are in, involved in the same kind of planning with us to finding they are unified with the Roxbury. They're trying to decide what they're going to do. They had a lot of decisions to make just like us to better understanding ourselves. So we felt like each of us will use that as a, as a, as a lens or a scenario to call it that, and then in the spring get back together and then decide if 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 when it was the best time to come together because there was no capacity to not just capacity but enough understanding of where our districts are to have a meaningful conversation. So th that's where we left it. So it's not the conversation is not closed by any means. We just wanted to have the right information to be able to make it a meaningful conversation. The other thing to keep in mind that I don't think we've clarified today, and some people might know and people don't know, is that the configuration committee that is meeting right now is we're going to look at what they propose in January, right? That's where we're going to have discussions with our community. So it's not, a, a, we're not going to be able to realize or, or propose like huge changes, right? A system can take huge changes in one year, right? We as a board recognize that. So we, what we're trying to do is build a path to that. Jonas, do you have something to share? Okay. Uh, so if, if that helps. So if that was our presentation, we have some other board business. I don't want to be the last one to talk. If there's any last comments from the community, we really appreciate you coming in this cold night and sharing your input with us and to the staff and to uh, our subs. Thank you for being here and extending your day. And to our community members, thank you for being here too. Yes, and McKellen had a question. Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, there's a question about the That's per student weighted whatever. Do we know what that means in percentage for the budget or no? Yeah. I don't really know much about it yet because I don't know what our pupils are going to be. Okay. So we can't like I'm, estimate what percentage that would be of the whole budget. I might be able to give you an estimate at the next meeting when we have better budget numbers too. Okay. Yes. Yep. Yep. 
it's going to be closely aligned with it because the budget is going to be closely aligned. So it all depends on how those pupils fluctuate. But it would be closer to 10% than 3% or no? <laughs> yes. I would yes. say, yeah, it's okay. going to be definitely closer to 10 than 3. Okay. That just seems like more of a solid line. Than... Anyway. All right. And then I wanted to say to all of you, um, because I hear your frustration that like let us know if there are th if there are things that are super important to you specific things because we haven't talked specifics at all but like for example a full-time nurse in every building or you know language in every school or whatever specifics are important to you then please email or let us know because I know it's hard with a blank slate but like we do want to know what's important to you now if we can hear it now Thank you. That was actually a helpful segue because like we do, uh, I say like we always do, but this is only my second budget season here. Um, we send a survey out so that others who couldn't make it today can provide input. So um, this will get pushed out on our various channels. You all can also give additional input to your point, Michaela, and this isn't the only opportunity, nor is the survey is not the only opportunity. But um, so we'll push this out on our various channels. It's linked in the presentation that will later be posted. Um, so there is another opportunity of one of several um, Thank you for that. The link will be in here. Thank you, everybody. We're going to move to number four in our agenda. So community input, connecting our vision and our, sorry, number four, number five, board operations. <laughs> Where are you going? No, it's not. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being here. Okay. So the communications and engagement planning on page three, you the executive committee, the steering committee has seen this a couple of times and the board members were able to see it at our last uh, board meeting and the finance committee has seen it a couple, a couple of times. So we thought that tonight we could concentrate on the two areas. If you're down there, it is, you know what, what is important to the board, as you know, is to engage and to communicate. So we were gonna try to focus, if you go back down to page four of the communication plan, if you have it in front of you, we were gonna try to concentrate in, in the board part of it and in the budget development and budget communication part of it. So hold input session, inform committee about the process meeting, meetings, communicate parameters and board updates. Uh, I'm wondering if there could be somebody volunteering. Carrie's been doing a really good job helping us uh, do an update after each board meeting. Are you willing to do this one to the next one, Carrie, or should I? Uh, today's okay. And and then in budget communication under annual budget meeting presentation and communicate the budget process. So it's mostly that we're staying. You know, we kind of have a plan. Megan, do you have something to add to that? No, I think we just talked about when the when the steering committee was thinking about this, they thought when we reflect as a board, it's helpful to have something to reflect on and communication felt like a good place to start. So the, the thinking is that we would just pull this up at the end of every meeting to say what needs to be communicated out. Is there something in addition to what's bulleted out here? Or you guys have like, three bullets that you think is essential. Go ahead, Daniel. I think I think one thing that came up in the course of that conversation and hearing that input is we need to reiterate the distinction between the configuration study process and the budget process, mm -hmm. the distinct timelines, the distinct roles the board and its committees are playing in each process. Thank you. Anything else? Go ahead, Ursula. Spencer is right behind you. Oh. Hi. Oh. So it was brought up by our community members, and we've talked about it as a board, is that we don't always hear from everybody in our community, especially those who 
might be disadvantaged. And I think that that's true again tonight is we did not hear from everybody in our community that we probably could have or should have. And it's just something we need to continue working on. Thank you. Thank you, Ursula. Okay. So then we're seeing no other hands up. Oh, let's go ahead, Diane. So it, I think what we also heard was a lot of anxiety about what's unknown. And so, um, you know, just reiterating that we're, we're working as quickly as we can to have uh, information put out there so that it, it's, they know what, what's being discussed. But what I was hearing was that anxiety around the unknown. Thank you, Dan. Go ahead, Lena. Is that on? Okay. Um, I just want to say that I agree with Ursula, and I think the point that she made about not hearing from everybody that um, might be disadvantaged is really important, especially just like in the day and age that we're in. I think we just really have to, like she said, try and keep reaching out to people and keep trying to make sure that people are like communicating about what they need and what they think is important. Thank you. All right, so seeing no other hands up, uh, we're gonna move into the personnel on page seven. And who's jumping to do this besides dear Ursula, are you ready or who's gonna do it? Go ahead. I'm nice that we accept the DC for nomination for the 23-24 school year of Nicole Minton, U32 school nurse. Thank you, Ursula. Thank you, Diane. Any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstain? The motion carries. Thank you. I move that we accept the extended leave of absence request from Kirsten Keese from U32. Thank you, Ursula. A second? Thank you, Natasha. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstain? Hearing none, the motion carries. Long-term? I move that we accept the long-term substitute for the 23-24 school year of Dylan Burns, U32, English, LTS. Thank you, Ursula, and thank you, Daniel. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstain? The motion carries. Thank you very much. It's exciting to have. Now moving back. Oops. I lost my paper copies. So I have to go up and down. All right. So future agenda items. You're gonna Next. Assist. Well, it's the it's budget. Our budget it's our budget. Yeah, it's our budget meeting. We have a lot of work to do to budget meeting. Do you want us to pull out the work planners? Can you take that as a, do you want me to, should we share the work plan or you're okay? Okay. So the next up is board reflection. Any board reflection from today's meeting? What work, what didn't, or hopefully, hopefully dinner. Go ahead. We've, we've, we've talked about the people that we don't hear from, but I want to honor the people that we do hear from. I, David is still online. Beck is always here. Right There are people, Chani shows up. There are a lot of people who come out and spend a lot of time at school board meetings with us. So a shout out to them. Thank you, Jonas. Any other board reflections? Go ahead, Daniel. Um, well, just one reaction. I don't have any answers, but the... Um, the learning we did, the presentation we got um, from Jillian, and then the conversation around the importance of the community and um, and also Willow, what you said about community. And just, I kept coming back to these problems we're facing. And I think a lot of it comes down to sort of how we're defining our community. And that's evolving, I guess as we speak and it's 
it's a struggle and it's, I think it's painful and it hurts my head to wrap my head around it, but it's also been done before and it can be done again. And I think that's sort of reimagining of our community is like a big piece of our, our job, I think. Thank you, Daniel. So that I would also add in reflection, um, I heard the word creativity from the community several times, and um, I'd like us to remember that as we go forward. We, uh, you know, the, the, the leadership will think creatively, and we have to realize it and recognize it when it's in front of us and help our community to see that creativity when the time comes to present the budget. Um, and also just reiterating what Flora said about uh, seismic change is not healthy and this is going to be a process, um, not just this year, but in years to come. Worked really well. Uh, I'll just speak loud. We were in the other room and it went that went really well, but um was there discussion about the parameter, the the uh rate of increase parameter? Did people have any feedback about that? Yeah, sure. Is it on? No, it's now it's on. It, we we shared that it was a soft parameter and right. that we we don't know necessarily what that is gonna be yet. And we okay. are leaving it flexible for the staff to come back. To us, it's a soft parameter, is what we're saying. And the rate of inflation, we know that you know, sort of is three point four, not necessarily three. So, so, so is it fair to say that the board like to revisit that and and re review it and have a real discussion about it? Yes, that to the finance committee, then bring it back to the board. But because we need to have a budget before all of that happens, we keep saying it's a soft parameter. So I guess we could do a show of thumbs as a board in reflection if you feel like. You agree that it's a soft parameter, it's not a hard parameter. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, if you're just asking whether or not we think it's soft, how soft? Well, I, I think my, at least what I was getting from the, from the board in, okay, is that, you know, like if we're looking at what the numbers that they're presenting to us right now are almost 13%, right? It, going with a 3% or even a 3.4 seems unrealistic right now. So having the having those numbers that you saw there, the 1% equals $300,000 more or less, and the 3% are guiding numbers for us to know how to read the budget and know how much money we need to take out if we want to go, but not ask the administrators to go to a 3.4% right now, but to be diligent and you know they you know we have to be sustainable in the long term so we're not trying to make it confusing for you guys but hopefully the i i can share a little bit of insight into how we're having this conversation i didn't know chris if your question was relevant uh, uh, 12 13, 12 13. Yeah. Yeah. yep um if it helps, just in terms of the work of the administration who also saw that number at the same time you did, uh, well, maybe a few hours before, um, we know there's a lot of distance between the rate of inflation and where we currently sit. And so we tried to put some framework around, well, we could approach it this way, we could approach it this way, we could approach it this way, and we'll show that to you. And it gave us a little bit of a... Um, a way to think about the distance between the two things and um, coming back to you with what we need to actually open schools and focus on programs this year, meaning focus on quality and the ability to deliver that. And so that's probably not helpful, but just know that we've been having this conversation and seeing it as a soft parameter just based on your last conversation, honestly. Um, I have a question. Megan, would it be helpful to uh, the administration to have a range number that the board might be contemplating uh, so that you say, if it's this, this is what we need to do. If it's this, 
rather than 12% and, and 3%, which is clearly not, um, but it, it would give us more information as to what the potential outlook would be at certain ranges. It's always easier for us to have direction. I think what we were trying to do is create direction from that big gap in between the two. So um, it would be helpful. And we're ready to bring you, well, we're not ready right now, but we will be ready by in, in two weeks to bring you something and explain to you why we chose the parameter. So in other words, I, I think we can work around either way. Okay, thank you. One thing I noticed in the conversation, and I think this is probably a pretty common thing, is that as soon as you put a number out there, that's the thing that everybody focuses on. And I think we you know, maybe should, should think more about like how do we frame this so that people understand there are all these other parameters that we also put on the budget and that we can't, we're not only going to look at the number, we're also going to look at, well, what what are the trade-offs? We can't cut one of the other ones completely out to make to make 3%. And I think that gets a little lost when everyone's you know, talking about the, about the number. Go ahead, Usa. I was going to use last year as an example when Megan and the administration team came back to us and said, we can't make your percent increase. Um, parameter and said, in order to keep academic achievement and student health and safety and humanity justice pillars strong, this is what we need. And this is the percent we can give you. I think that that's what I see when we say that this is a soft target. Thank you, Ursula. Okay. So let's move into our executive session. So I'm going to be, we're going to have two executive sessions. So people that need to go home, one in student residency request and one in negotiations. Coming out of the second one, we will be taking an action as you heard. So for ORCA and others that want to be part of that, please wait for us here. Otherwise, we are going to go to the, go to the, room, and go to the room and come back. So that it made it easier instead of, because otherwise we have to recreate this whole setup. So we will just travel to the R room and come back here when we're, when we're done. So I'm looking for a motion to go into executive session if for a student resident request. Wait. This is purely logistic on my part. Suzanne needs to be with us or we would request that the board ask Suzanne in for negotiations. Can we flip it so we can do negotiations sure. and first then they and then can Suzanne go. can leave? Sure. Yeah. So can you want to flip your motion? In... It's okay. To include. Thank you, Chris. Uh, second by Michaela. In... Sorry. Lisa, you have that. <laughs> I need like a helper with, am I like a, okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Any opposed, any abstain? Okay, we're in executive session in the art room, so walk. All right, we're out of executive session and I'm looking for a motion to ratify our contract. Uh, Jonas, you have the language. I move to approve the 2023 to 2024 to 2025 to 26 collective a bargaining agreement reached with the Washington Central Educators Union Teachers Bargaining Unit. Thank you, Jonas. Is second by Diane. Sure. Any discussion? I Go just, ahead, Diane. Uh, Daniel. For the record, I just wanted to declare my conflict of interest and intention to abstain from the vote. Thank you, Daniel. Any other discussion? I think I just want to say just publicly thank you to the negotiations committee. It's a lot of work. And thank you to Suzanne and thank you to Megan. This is a great accomplishment for our district. All right. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Any oppose? Any abstentions? Okay, we have one. Jonas, you have that. All right. So moving on, we have another executive session, but Suzanne, thank you for being here. And yeah, try carefully. Okay, and I'm looking for a second. 
Thank you, Diane. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. And we're going back to the same room. Sorry, shouldn't take long. So before Jonah's computer dies, I'm looking for a motion to... Uh, thank you, Jonas, a second. Okay, second by Chris. Okay, all those in favor of accepting the request, please signify by saying aye. So I'm gonna do a show of hands for the ones that, it, because it's gonna be hard. So can you please raise your hand if you're granting the request? One, two, three, four, five, oop, six, seven, eight, here. Okay, eight, yes. Uh, no's, raise your hand. I guess it doesn't really matter. One, two, three, four, five, six. So. The what? Okay. So the end of the school year. Okay. Thank you. Thank thank you by Ursula. Second by Ursula. Those in favor, please signify by saying aye. And thank you for being here tonight. Night.